when we, we looked at talent. But this morning, we are going to look at the gift of time. But there are others that we will, in due time, we will touch on those very gifts that God has given us. And where I wanted to focus, where I wanted to enlarge in the children's story, is that while we are waiting, how are we going to use our time? While we are waiting and watching, how are we going to use our time? The big idea this morning is this. It is his to give. I want you to say it. One, two. And ours to manage. It is his to give. He has given us the gift of time, but it is ours to manage. I want you to put on your imaginary thinking caps. Could you do that with me? Here we have a picture of the ANZ Stadium in Sydney. I want you to picture on Sunday, there's going to be a big, massive crusade. Huh? Sydney, yes. Did I say Brisbane? No. No. It's in Sydney. <laughs> yes, you're right. And just picture that all the churches, the Seventh-day Adventist churches, are coming to this venue and it's going to be packed out. But you thought you'd decide, you know what, I'm going to go a little bit early. Because I want to get a good seat. But a seat that's right up to the top. Remember, put on your thinking cap. So you go to the stadium. No one's there. And you walk right up to the top of the ANZ. The top seats. And there you sit down. And then you go, okay. I'm going to wait patiently. And then it starts to move towards midday. And a gentleman comes along. And he comes with this bottle. Remember, put on your imaginary caps. Comes with this bottle. And then he pulls out this, this drop. And he drops. He drops a drop of water. Just on the ground. And with this water, it multiplies. Every minute, boom, it multiplies. And so it's interesting because if the stadium were watertight, how long would we have to get out of the stadium so that we wouldn't drown? Okay, this is the ANZ Stadium. You're sitting right at the top. This bloke comes and he drops some sort of water drop, but it somehow multiplies. From that moment, how long would it take for you to get out? And if you do not get out, then you will drown. And so I'm using this to illustrate so bear with me. By 12.45, 1.5 meter of water has already come up. That's 12.45. And, but there's still 93% of that stadium that is empty. Now check this out. Five minutes later, boom. Five minutes later, if that ANZ stadium was watertight, the water would have just risen and you would have had to evacuate your seat right at the top, 12.49 p.m. This is the power of compounding geometric progression. You know what that means? I'm glad you didn't ask. But anyway, we have this guy here, Christopher Martison. He is an economic researcher, a writer, a trend forecaster, interested in macro trends regarding the economy, energy, composition, and also the environment. And so Martison warns with our planet today, it's what he calls the hockey stick graphs. Now, these are the global trends that for centuries have appeared to be flatlined with slow incremental growth, but then suddenly have the power of the growth to explode. All right? So you're seeing that it's just going along, and then all of a sudden it starts to take off and explode. So he uses these, he identifies these hockey stick graphs, and as you, as you can see, this is the world population, as it's just like coming, coming, coming through here. But when we come to the 1900s, between the, the millennium, there we start to see the rise. 
In a very short time, things have just quickly escalated. We see the oil usage. We see it from the 1965, how it just continues to climb. More and more people in countries are using oil. And that's why it's so expensive. But then we look at fresh water, the usage in the 1900s. There we start to see the climb. But as we start to see, it starts to really jump. We talk about debt. Wow. The government um, in billions, 571.4, are in the billions of debt. Not just only government debt, but we also, there is a consumer, as the population is starting to, more and more people are going into debt. The five minute difference on an exponential curve. The outward appearances, the stadium has hardly any water in it, but plenty of time left to get out. But as the researcher warns, in these opening years of the third millennium, Earth is going to be facing what he calls a perfect storm, or I will call an iceberg. A perfect storm of critical trends now simultaneously skyrocketing off the grass, global debt, energy, consumption, and the list goes on and on. Christopher Madison he writes about economic and ecological survival. That's a speciality. But others have studied nuclear war, climate change, and the pandemic. Something is happening. Particularly in these last days, things are really, just, just think about it. Just think about the technology. How much that we have just skyrocketed. You know, we, we, you know now we'll be sort of talking we're having those conversations. Is that man a woman? Or is that woman a man? You know? We're coming to a, there's, there will be a time where we would say, is that person even human? 60 Minutes, they put a documentary and it highlighted that this robot was being interviewed. And man, it just said all these things and it's only a matter of time. And you've heard the term AI. Have you? AI is in everything. If you have a smartphone, AI is tracking you. It's everywhere. Even if you go shopping, your cars have AI, your computers. We can't escape it. So while we are still here, how are we supposed to wait and watch? Particularly when we see the trends of a hockey stick just skyrocketed in the last short amount of time. Ladies and gentlemen, we are definitely living in the end time. Amen. This morning in Sabbath school, we were, we were reminded of the lessons coming towards looking at Revelation 12 or 13. Things are starting to pick up. Things that, a comment was made, things that we already know, but we are in that generation where we are starting to see. You know, it's interesting. Here is a, a picture. Does anyone know what this picture of this particular ship? Titanic. Yes, yes. It's the Titanic. And it's interesting because when they built this ship, this ship was, they thought was unsinkable. And the captain of, at the time, he said these words, not even God could sink this ship. That's how much security and faith that they had in this ship. So when they left the port, when they left the port four days into their journey, and there were feedback from other ships that in this time, there are a lot of icebergs. But the captain continued to ignore. It did not, and failed to even alter the speed. He goes, no, oh, let's just go speed ahead. And some of you guys have seen the movie, The Titanic. You know, there were people down deck below that were eating, they were laughing, they were even dancing. You know, here are the people of that time, a generation where they're saying, hey, where there is peace and that they feel safe in this big ship that not even God can even sink. But April 14th at approximately 11.40 p.m., 
that's when the Titanic hit that ship and was ripped open like a can of sardines and water started to pour on. But people down below did not realize what was going on. And we are reminded, ladies and gentlemen, that in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Oh, you're seeing a generation, peace and safety, neglecting the warning signs, things that we have studied for many years, and some of the things we share, even Adventists who have gone away realizing, wow, something is happening. But we don't have much time. Auntie Ellen, she said this in testimonies, that great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones, like the hockey stick. 1900s, things then just started to move upward and it's not going to drop. It is not going to drop. She says in Christ's object lessons, our time belongs to God. Every moment is his and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to his glory. Amen? We are to improve it to his glory. Of no talent he has given, will he require a more strict account than of our time? The question is, how are you using your time? How are you using our time? How might we best manage the time that God has entrusted to us? I want to put a, I want to put a graph here. Not a graph, but a diagram. And it's the, what I call the time management matrix. You see on one hand, there's four quadrants. On one, the top part is, is things that are important, things that are not important. As you see at the top, it's got urgent, and then it's got not urgent. So quadrant one, these are the things, these are important, but these are urgent things. Okay? So these are things like when there's a crisis, there's a pressing problem, deadlines. If you go on assignment, go, oh, it's important, it's urgent. That's quadrant one. Quadrant two, it highlights, okay, these things are not urgent, but they are important. But if you come here to the bottom, it, these things are, they're not important, but they're kind of like urgent. It's, it's when your interruption, someone calls, or some mail comes through, some reports, some meetings, um, pressing matters, popular activities. These things are urgent, but they're not important. But when you come to number four, these things are not important, but they are not urgent at the same time. When we look at this matrix, where do you think that we need to spend more of our time? Okay, okay. Raise your hand if you think it should be number one, quadrant one. That's where we need to be. Okay. All right, okay. All right. Raise your hand if you think it's quadrant two. Okay, the whole truth. How about I say quadrant two is where we need to spend more of our time? Because quadrant one, these are the urgent things. But if all we do is just kind of work on the urgent, but we fail to work on the things that are important, they're still urgent. They're not as urgent, but they're important. And so there's this tension. There's this tension between urgent and important. Sometimes the urgent things are not as important. Are you tracking with me? I wanted to highlight this. Luke chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, turn with me there. Luke chapter 8, or oh, 10, sorry. I told you. Amen. Absolutely. I agree with you. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. You know that song? Yes. So Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. You know the story. I'm going to highlight something very significant. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village 
And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called, what's the sister's name? Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve all alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken. You know, when we look at Mary, what she was busy with isn't necessarily bad. Isn't necessarily bad. Yeah, okay. So it's not necessarily bad. But what we do find is that she got so worked up that it distracted her from what she was wanting to do, and that was to serve. We know that Jesus was in the house. We know that Jesus was with the disciples, and, and maybe they were present or maybe outside. So there was a lot of serving in the house. You know, in the Pacific Island culture, you know, when somebody when somebody comes, oh, man, let's uh, you see the pastor or anybody come and say, hey, quickly, clean the sitting room or put the rubbish away and, you know, make it presentable. And then, you know, just within that two or three minutes, while they are walking up the driveway, everyone's frantically running around, chucking rubbish, whatever, and putting it, and the next minute goes, hello, how are you? I know you guys are not like that. You guys can be, you guys can be yourself. But here we have Mary. She was distracted. Why? She was serving Jesus. But she wasn't focusing on Jesus. She was focusing on her sister. When we serve, sometimes we can get distracted. And it disturbs us. It distracts us. To the point where we say, Oh, Lord, why am I the only one here at the work in me? Where is Pastor Francis? He should be here. Or, oh, hey, how come no one's putting away the tables and chairs? I'm the only one. Where's Richard? Eh? Or how come no one is helping to come and do the dishes while the rest of the group are ready to have some sort of seminar in the afternoon? And you hear the pots getting louder and louder, being banged, you know, guess, oh, what's going on in there? Sometimes when we serve, we get easily distracted, particularly when we start looking other people and what they are not doing, who's not there. How about you just focus on what you are doing in that moment rather than looking around to see who's there, who's not there, who should be there? Because you're just going to distract yourself. Just as Mary was distracted, what she was doing was not a bad thing. But what Martha was doing was even better. And when we look at these two ideas, here we see, um, when we go back to that quadrant, here we see Mary in quadrant, um, quadrant one. Jesus is rocked up, the disciples, quickly, let's get some stuff ready. It's, you know, it's in that mode. But you don't want to be living life always, always focusing on the urgent because sometimes the urgent things are not as important. Quadrant two is where you need to be where it's important, but it may not be urgent at that moment. And these are the things, spiritual disciplines, reading your Bible, prayer, serving. These are the things where you and I need to be. You know, it's, it's interesting that you know, there are two sisters, and I love what Jesus says. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Because she's focusing on, on her sister, instead of focusing on what she was doing. And it just troubled her. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. You know, friends, this morning I want to remind you that in Revelation 12, 12, that the devil is filled with fury because he knows his time is what? He knows that his time is short. And the less time he has, 
the more and more that he will attack God's people, particularly in this moment of earth's history. Would you say amen? We must be on our guard. We must watch and wait. Understanding that Jesus is coming very soon. Sometimes we get distracted by the things, by looking at other people. Instead of focusing on what God has put on you. You know, that great controversy is happening right now. It even impacts on time. And I want to highlight, you may not be able to see it, but on this side we've got God's blueprint, and then on the other side we see Satan's counterfeit. So God's blueprint is that every moment is a precious gift, and I will be most blessed if I use it for His glory. Would you say amen? But if Satan's counterfeit is this, I've got all the time in the world. Party on! Time is mine, and I can use it how I want it. Here we have God's blueprint. God created the world in six literal, 24-hour days, and he rested on the seventh day. But Satan's counterfeit, the earth evolved over millions of years, and it will just keep going. We find here, busyness can take us away from God. But here, and we see this in societies that, Busyness is the best way to get ahead. Here we have Earth's time will soon be finished, but then we find in Satan's counterfeit, mankind will find a way to save the planet from the total destruction. Just when they built that Titanic, not even God could sink that ship. Oh, they were wrong. Today is the day of salvation. I mustn't delay my commitment to God, but Satan's counterfeit is that there's no rush. Make your eternal choices tomorrow. Do it tomorrow. But tomorrow may never come. In Daniel 12, verse 3, we're reminded those who are wise. Do we have any wise people in the house? Who say amen? Amen. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Let's be a people in these last days, people who are wise. We have a lot of people who are very knowledgeable, but the same people who have a lot of, a lot of knowledge sometimes do not exercise wisdom. You know what I'm saying? And so we need to be wise people. Auntie Ellen came these words in Christ Object Lessons that we are admonished to redeem time, but time squandered can never be recovered. We cannot call back even one moment. The only way in which we can redeem our time is by making the most of what of that which remains by being co-workers with God in his great plan of redemption. You know, friends, this morning, you know, we cannot save time. But we can sure invest in the time that we have left on planet Earth. If we have the everlasting gospel, then what are we doing with that everlasting gospel? Do we just come Sabbath, each Sabbath, remind each, um, remind each other, or our congregation, on how we had this awesome truth. But how does that translate into everyday living? We don't want to be people that say, we have the truth, we have the message. But you know what? Then people in the community say, since they have been to the most grumpiest people I've ever met. We don't want people in the community to say that. It's one thing to have truth, but we need to allow God's love to translate that truth in practical ways. And when we start doing that, I believe that they will start to listen to us. But if all we're going to do is condemn them and this is going to happen, you go into hell if you believe in such a place, wow. All we're doing is pushing them further and further away. I think we need to be wise. We have a message. I think we need to love and connect with people. And it's a matter of time we start to share. They will listen if they can trust you. But if they don't trust us, we could scream from the mountaintop, they wouldn't even listen. 
they won't even give us their time to listen because they because we fail to exercise our trustworthiness that comes with this eternal gospel. Here's a couple of well looking at the times I'm gonna just cut it short right now. But tip number one is this find out what role can you play in God's mission. If we believe that mission began with God and the mission has a church, not the church has a mission. You know what I'm saying? You and I, we are the hands and feet of God. Let's put that into practical use. Let's not just keep talking about theories and start talking about um, point forms or whatever. Let's really just allow the Spirit of God then to work in our lives and it is important that you and I, that we find what role can we play in God's mission as we move towards the end of time. And secondly, learn to number your days. Learn to number your days. Here we highlight is that schedule your priorities instead of prioritizing your schedule. It's a great way to remember that we need a schedule that we need to schedule our priorities instead of prioritizing our schedules. What is this saying? What is it saying? That unless we schedule the things that are really important to us, we will be doomed to be always doing only that which is important to others. Ah, did you hear what I say? We need to put down the big rocks that are solid for us. And if you were to be honest, I want you to look at what you normally do in the day and then what you normally do in the week. And I guess the question, are we good stewards of the time that God has given us? What impact can we make in somebody's life that is going to impact them for eternity? Amen? We have this beautiful message Sometimes it's not what we say, it's how we say it to people that will either make them listen or we tell them to go the other way. But I believe, use your personality, use it in a way, identify your place in God's mission so that you will be able to be able to witness and to be a man among wolves, instead of being a wolf among wolves. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so, I'm going to leave this question as we close. How to be faithful with time? The answer is a faithful steward does what their master would do if he was present. Live each moment. Live each moment as if it were your last. Take one step at a time. Dear Jesus, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. In closing, I want to share a story. I'm going to invite the, the organists and the pianists and the singers to come up and take their place. And as they're coming, there's a story that took place in a small coastal town of Portville, New York. And there was an old lighthouse. And a lighthouse keeper, for many years, his name was Jeremiah. For nearly 40 years, Jeremiah maintained a lighthouse that guided the ship safely to the harbor. His job was to keep the light shining every night, regardless of the weather. So each evening... It was the same routine. Six o'clock, he would get up there, he would begin to climb, and there he would meticulously clean the glass, ensuring that the beacon could shine its light as far as possible. It was one of those old school that you had to use oil, and it was a lamp. But he knew that the new age was dawning, and that they were going to bring in a new system that would eventually replace him, where everything would be done automatic. So as he finally read it, he realized 
And then you've got a few more days before the crew come in to install and to install this thing that makes it automatic. It means he doesn't have a job. A storm came. And it came so fierce that he had to decide was he going to just abandon his post because the crew is not here, he's out of the job. Or is he going to stand, stand and be able to shine that light? When the storm passed, many ships, many passengers, many sailors came to him to thank him for shining that light on that particular night. Because if it wasn't for them, they would no longer be around you see, he saw that he was serving his master right to the end. What about yourself? Is there a time you get to a point and say, yep, yeah, I've done my duty, I'm checking out? Or will you continue to be that faithful steward? When the hockey curve continues to skyrocket, that you and I will continue to be faithful, waiting and watching and making the most of our time as if Jesus was present. May God bless you. And I pray that as you take this message, think about how are you going to utilize the message or the time that you have left.